Okay, so I think uh, we'll make a start now. Uh, this is just uh, in case you wondered why uh, Gibbs free energy is called a free energy. It is in principle the amount uh, you can recover to do useful mechanical work. Okay? So that's the reason why it's called free energy. Now, I'm going to talk today about solutions. That means uh, a particular mixture of components. For example, salt in water is a solution, but we can even have solid solutions, copper in zinc or zinc in copper, etc. And how to deal with that in the thermodynamic context. <laughs> because we've done the free energy of a pure phase. We've defined equilibrium between pure phases, but we haven't dealt with impure phases. Just to uh, present a mechanical analogy for what equilibrium means, Equilibrium means that if I give this ball a slight perturbation, an infinitesimal perturbation, it'll come back to its original position. This is metastable equilibrium in the sense that this may not be the lowest energy minimum. There might be another minimum point here. But from our point of view, from a thermodynamic point of view, there's absolutely no difference between metastable equilibrium and equilibrium. We can treat them with exactly the same theory. Because we never know whether there is an even lower minimum somewhere. This is also equilibrium, but it's unstable equilibrium in the sense that if we give that ball an infinitesimal perturbation, it will roll down this hill. Okay. But if we don't disturb it, it will stay at that position. It's like a coin on an edge. And this, of course, is simply unstable, the ball is rolling down that hill and it's dissipating free energy. None of these are dissipating free energy. So this, this, is, this process can't be described using thermodynamics. Free energy is being dissipated as the ball rolls down the hill. Now, we did this uh, in the last lecture, where we plotted the free energy of pure iron in its cubic F crystal structure and pure iron in its cubic I crystal structure. And this is the temperature at which the two phases are in equilibrium. And the red line here represents the condition of minimum free energy. So if I plotted a phase diagram on this side, I would only have gamma existing because it's the lowest free energy uh, phase. And on this side, I would only have alpha existing. But again, this is a pure substance. I don't have any axis here which defines um, composition. And today's main task is to deal with solutions. Well, how do you make a solution? You first of all have the pure components, A and B, and you take certain proportions. X is the mole fraction of B, if I take the total total amount of material, x is the mole fraction of b, and therefore 1 minus x is the mole fraction of a. Everyone understand what a mole fraction means? If I count the number of atoms of b and divide by the total number of atoms, that's the mole fraction. If I multiply this by 100, that gives me the atomic percent. So I have these large lumps which might cons contain you know, huge numbers of atoms, 10 to the power of 20, typically. Okay. Large lumps of A and large lumps of B. What will be the free energy when I mix them up without breaking them? Okay. So these are large lumps. Well, if I have very large lumps, then most of the atoms of A are not seeing the atoms of B because they are inside the particle. Right? So it's perfectly reasonable to take the average free energy of A and B weighted by their concentrations. So this is what we call the free energy of a mechanical mixture of A and B, which means that we put them together, but they're not really feeling each other's presence because the vast majority of atoms don't see uh, the other atoms. So is everybody happy with this construction? This is called a mechanical mixture. But the total free energy is simply the average of the A and the B weighted according to the concentrations. I'm going to use this terminology here now to define the free energy of pure A. So the superscript 
zero over there identifies that as pure A, the free energy of pure A, and this is the free energy of pure B. I'm using that instead of G because G is now that of uh, the free energy of the mixture. And when I get to A atoms and B atoms being intimately mixed in a solution, I will use yet another term because then it's no longer pure A. Okay, so this is the free energy of a mechanical mixture. It's not a solution. When does this become a solution? Yeah, when all the atoms are intimately mixed. Okay. So, um, before we can treat that, we need to show what happens when we mix atoms, even if there is no change in enthalpy. In other words, when I break AA bonds and I break BB bonds to form AB bonds, there is no change in enthalpy. Uh, that is what we call an ideal solution. And to do that, we need to think a little bit more about entropy. Now, in the last lecture, we saw that a change in entropy is given by the amount of heat we put into the system reversibly for a given temperature T. And Delta S is the integral from T1 to T2, therefore, of Cp over T dt, because Cp into dt is simply dq. Now, the fact that you can do this integral means that we can add entropies up, right? In other words, if I have S1 and S2, I can add them up to get S3. So that's what we call a capacity property. That means if I have one gram of material here and two grams, I can add them up and I get three grams of material. So mass is a capacity property. If I have two different volumes, I can add them up to get a third volume. That's a capacity property. So entropy can be added up to get a, a further entropy. Is everybody happy with that? So entropy must be a capacity property. But we looked at entropy in a different way as well. We thought about it in terms of probabilities. And just to remind you, here is the diagram that I use. This is a cylinder of gas. And in this scenario, all the gas atoms are on one side, and there's a perfect vacuum here. And the number of ways I can generate that arrangement is just one. In this case, I have them thoroughly distributed here. And the number of ways in which I can generate this scenario is very, very large because these atoms are indistinguishable. And I can simply swap positions. Yeah. So the probability of getting this distribution of atoms is very, very large compared with this probability. Uh, and W is, is known as the number of arrangements that we can make. Yeah? Now, Unfortunately, W is not a capacity property. So, for example, if I throw a dice and get, I get a, a 1, and I get a 1 again when I throw it again, the total probability of getting two 1s is just 1 sixth multiplied by 1 sixth, isn't it? It's not 1 sixth plus 1 sixth. So here, the total entropy wouldn't be the W for this and the W for this added. They've got to be multiplied. So Boltzmann realized this, that although probability is connected with entropy in terms of this order-disorder phenomenon that we think about, the number of arrangements is not a capacity property. So he used instead the log of the number of arrangements, because if you add log w1 plus log w2, then that's like multiplying probabilities, isn't it? So W is not a capacity property of the system. And this is the example that I gave you of throwing a, a die, that the probability of getting two successive sixes is one upon six squared. It's not one sixth plus one sixth. So Boltzmann realized that we should be really using log of W uh, and not W in order to quantify disorder, the extent of disorder. So, now, log of W becomes a capacity property, but it's still not entropy, because 
The log of a number doesn't have any units, does it? Yeah? So he put a constant in front of it, and that constant is the Boltzmann constant. Okay? So entropy now becomes S is equal to K log W. And w is the number of arrangements. This is actually Boltzmann's uh, tombstone, and this equation is inscribed on it. And at the time he produced this equation, nobody actually believed him. And he got so depressed that he committed suicide. Okay, so we can calculate entropy uh, in terms of the amount of uh, configuration that we can generate, the number of different arrangements that we can generate. So when I take my large lumps of A and B, and I produce a solution which is an intimate mixture of atoms. Okay. And for the moment we are considering the case where there is no change in bond energies when we mix them up. In other words, the A atoms are indifferent as to whether they are next to B atoms or A atoms. Yeah, they don't care about who their neighbor is. There is no change in bond energy when I take an AA bond and a BB bond to generate two AB bonds, okay? So the only change that has happened is that we've got a scenario where the probability is much, much larger. Yeah. Here we can only have one arrangement, here we can have a very large number of arrangements depending on how many atoms we have, right? We'll, we'll actually do a calculation of the number of arrangements at some stage. But you can appreciate that if I have a mixture of A and B atoms, to get this, I can have very many more arrangements than just to have two lumps there. Okay. And that causes a reduction in free energy, which is exactly minus T K log W. K log W is the Boltzmann equation. And even though we have no change in bond energy, we have this reduction in free energy on mixing up the atoms. So, obviously, the largest reduction will happen when I have equal numbers of A and B atoms. <coughs> so this minimum will be located at 0.5. Uh, this is called the free energy of mixing, delta G with a subscript M. And if I have a particular composition here, then that gives me the free energy of that solution. Obviously, when we have pure material, there's no difference between you know, a mechanical mixture and a solution, because we've only got one arrangement in both cases. Everybody happy with that? So, does that mean uh, every mechanical mixture has to you know, have a lower free energy in order to become a solution? <coughs> you are right. Uh, so the question is, you know, does that mean that every mechanical mixture will re lead to a reduction in free energy? And that's correct as long as this is also satisfied. Yeah. So I'm considering a case where there is no change in binding energies when I mix the atoms up. Now it is possible that this change is not favorable. So for example, when I mix oil and water, they will be separate. Yeah, they are immiscible, and that's because of this condition. The entropy change always favors mixing. And remember, the contribution to this scales with temperature, because it's K T log W. At zero Kelvin, this has no contribution. But at high temperatures, it's a very large term. So as you go to higher and higher temperatures, even oil and water will mix. And there are many social analogies with thermodynamics. We have conservatives and we have labor politicians. But supposing the temperature rises, that means there's a, uh, there's a justified war. Then they will all unite. Yeah, they mix up. And as soon as the temperature falls, they will start to push their own viewpoints. Okay, so we've dealt with the free energy of mixing. Okay. We need to think about 
how an A atom behaves in this mixture or how a B atom behaves in that mixture. <coughs> so, just to remind you, this is the free energy of an A atom in pure A. And this is the free energy of a B atom in pure B. And supposing we have a solution of composition X, where X is the mole fraction of B, then its free energy is given by this number here. But what I'd like to know is what is the contribution of the A atom to the free energy of the solution and what is the contribution of the B atom to that solution. So, if I draw a tangent to this curve at this point, then I will have an intercept on this axis and an intercept on this axis. I'll explain to you why we are drawing this tangent in a minute. But you can see clearly that if I draw a tangent, then there will be an intercept which we'll call mu A on the A axis and mu B on the B axis. And the reason why I've written these braces here with an X is that, of course, that intercept depends on what concentration we have. If my concentration is here, then the intercept is different. Now, the equation of this line is straightforward. It's basically that G of X is equal to 1 minus X into mu A plus X into mu B. Yeah? Can you see that? This is the equation of this blue line here. Because look, if I said x equals to 0 over here, then I get simply mu a. Okay. If I said 1 minus x equals 0, I simply get mu b. So that's the equation of the line. In other words, we are saying that this free energy g is simply a weighted mean of the intercepts mu a and mu b. This is an extremely important equation okay, because it tells us that, look, the contribution to the free energy of solution due to A atoms is this, and the contribution to the free energy of the solution due to B atoms is this. In other words, we've separated out the effects of A and B in that solution. Yeah? This term is only dependent on A, and this term is only dependent on B. So this is the free energy of A atoms in a solution of composition X. <coughs> so we've isolated the effect of A. And similarly here, we have isolated the effect of B. And in thermodynamics, you call this the chemical potential of A and the chemical potential of B. So, chemical potential of A in a solution of a certain composition. Uh, uh, mu A and mu B, is it the isn't the free energy of A independent of, of the molar factor? No, it is. When you multiply, you are multiplying this with the molar factor. Yes. So basically it is independent uh, free energy. Yeah, this, this number here, okay, is multiplied by the concentration here, and this one by the concentration of B. So you get the average of those two to give you the total free energy. Now, if you think about the English language meaning of the term potential, you know, you have a certain potential to achieve when you leave this university. This is as if it is how the A atoms behave in a solution of a certain composition, as opposed to how they behave in the pure state. And that's why we use the term chemical potential. 
but your behavior will be different to how they behave in a pure material. Mm. This, this applies to any kind of solution. This because applies to any kind of solution. Yeah, irrespective of whether it's gases, liquids, or solids. I mean, even if there are no ideal solutions. Yeah, uh, yes, this applies to any kind of solution, that's right, even if the entropy of mixing is not zero. Mm -hmm. Because here, I haven't made any statements about this curve, it's just a free energy curve. Now you'll see why this is really, really important. Uh, are you all happy with this? Okay, so we call this the chemical potential of A and the chemical potential of B. Uh, this is just repeating this equation. And repeating it again. <laughs> Right. If, if I have two solutions now, <coughs> this is where it becomes important. If I have two solutions and I want to find out whether they are in equilibrium, then I can say that, look, they are in equilibrium if the chemical potential of A in alpha is the same as the chemical potential of A in gamma. In other words, the free energy of an atom in the alpha solution is the same as the free energy of an A atom in the gamma solution. and that the free energy of a B atom in alpha is the same as the free energy of B in gamma. Yeah. That's how we define equilibrium between solutions. And if I have 20 different elements, I just write 20 different equations which have to be satisfied simultaneously. And in terms of a picture, this is where the common tangent construction, which you might have come across, comes from. Because look, I now have two solutions, alpha and gamma, so we have two free energy curves. If I draw a common tangent to them, then the intercept over here will be identical for this solution and this solution. In other words, the free energy of A in alpha will be the same as the free energy of A in gamma. Right? And similarly, if I go on the other side, the free energy of B atoms in alpha will be the same as B atoms in gamma. Have you come across this construction before? Yeah, defining equilibria between solutions where you draw a common tangent. Well, if you haven't, it's simply the equations that are presented here. Because what we're doing is we're making sure that the free energy of A in alpha is the same as the free energy of A in gamma and for the other components. Are you happy? Now, notice that equilibrium does not mean that the composition concentration of B in alpha is the same as the concentration of B in gamma. And you know, this should have caused you a lot of confusion when you look at phase diagrams. You've got a certain phase in equilibrium with another, even though they have different compositions. Why isn't that diffusion happening if they have different compositions? Well, diffusion is strictly driven by free energy gradients. And if there is no free energy gradient, because we have this, then there won't be any diffusion. Yeah? So you can have two different phases with different chemical compositions and yet they will not change when you put them into contact if they satisfy this condition. Okay? What happens if it's not possible to draw a tangent? You do not uh, get the phases in equilibrium. So one, one such case would be, let me illustrate. So I'm plotting free energy composition. And I have a phase here that's called alpha. And I have liquid. Okay. And we are at a low temperature. So you can never have alpha and liquid in equilibrium at a low temperature. So this is really an important concept, and I hope you all understand that the meaning of chemical potential is simply the free energy of an A atom in a solution of this composition, and the free energy of a B atom <coughs> in a solution of this composition. And it's not properly explained in most textbooks, because they simply give you a mathematical meaning to mu. But the physical meaning is pretty straightforward. Okay. And equilibrium is not defined by these equations. That means that the concentration of A in alpha, which is in equilibrium with gamma, is not equal to the concentration of A in gamma, which is in equilibrium with alpha. 
compositions need not be the same. Okay. And this is just to show you ice and water. You know, the ice is purer than the salt water, and yet it is in equilibrium. Yeah. There's no diffusion of salt from the salt water to the ice, even though the concentration is higher in the water. Happy with that? Okay, now, we have demonstrated that the behavior of an A atom in a solution of A and B is different from the behavior of an A atom in the pure material. Yeah, because mu A is different from mu naught A, right? And some people say, therefore, that the activity of an A atom in a solution is different from its activity in a pure substance. And the reason why this terminology arises is that we have pure A and we measure the vapor pressure of A. It will be different from if we have a solution of A, there will be a different vapor pressure because maybe the B atoms are attracting the A atoms and therefore the A atoms don't want to escape into the vapor. So, the activity of A atoms would be reduced relative to the pure material, even if uh, the concentration is identical. So, when we plot activity versus mole fraction, uh, this is what we call an ideal solution, where the A atoms and B atoms are indifferent to what sort of neighbors they have. So, the behavior of an A atom would not be very different from that of uh, uh, that in a pure solution. The activity is the same as concentration. If the B atoms and the A atoms have a strong attraction, then the effective concentration is reduced. Okay. So the activity, uh, sorry, the activity becomes less than the concentration. On the other hand, if they repel each other, they really don't like to be next to each other, the A and the B atoms, then we have a case where the activity is actually greater than the concentration because they want to escape from the solution. That's the meaning of activity. And really, in terms of this diagram, is, is basically this difference here between the pure and the chemical potential. Okay? And you write mu alpha A is equal to mu naught alpha A, that's for the pure one, plus a term which is related to the activity. The effective concentration. The activity is the effective concentration. So this is RT log activity of A in alpha. Now you don't need to really know this, but you will come across it. Chemical potential is sufficient to deal with everything. So it really defines the difference between the behavior of an A atom in a pure solution as opposed to in an impure solution. This is it. And the relationship between activity and concentration is an activity coefficient here, which is this capital gamma. Again, we won't be using activity after this, really. But just in case you come across it in the literature, this is what it means. Now, I haven't gone into cases where there are actually changes in the binding energy when we mix the atoms up. Okay. And that's what we call the enthalpy of mixing. When the enthalpy of mixing is zero, that means that there's no change when we split a pair of A atoms and a pair of B atoms to generate two AB bonds. Okay. So that's what we call an ideal solution and the free energy curve will always be of that shape. Yeah, whatever the temperature, it will always be of that shape. Do you know why? It's because the only <coughs> contribution to the free energy of mixing is the entropy of mixing. Um, again, when we have an enthalpy of mixing which is um, positive, that means when we break AA bonds and BB bonds to generate AB bonds, there is actually an increase in bond energy. At very high temperatures, the curve will still be of this shape. 
Any ideas why? Yeah, because remember, I, I said that the entropy term scales in temperature, doesn't it? So whatever your enthalpy changes, eventually you'll get your temperature. <coughs> it doesn't matter, and this term completely dominates. So in this case, we have 3000 Kelvin, and the shape of the curve is still like that of an ideal solution. It's depressed because we have contributions from other things. Okay. Now, as I go to lower and lower temperatures, this term begins to become small, and the enthalpy term starts to dominate. So you get this kind of a curve with two minima here. Now, why do we have two minima? You know, A rich and B rich regions. Obviously, if the enthalpy of mixing is positive, then the A atoms really don't want to be next to B atoms. Yeah, so you have A rich regions with a minimum and B rich regions with a minimum. They want to be next to their own kind. As, as long as the entropy term is small, you tend to cluster A atoms and B atoms. And the effect becomes more and more pronounced as we go to lower and lower temperatures. Okay? So your solution can spontaneously decompose into two regions, what, uh, clusters of A atoms and clusters of B atoms. We'll do that in more detail in the next lecture, where we'll treat this, uh, these terms uh, rigorously. Everybody happy? Any questions? So remember, we've learned incredibly important concepts, chemical potentials, and you now know the physical meaning of the chemical potential. It's simply the free energy of an A atom in a solution of this composition, and the free energy of a B atom in a solution of that composition. And furthermore, we've defined equilibria between phases, in multi-component systems. If I have 20 different elements, it's not a problem. I simply write 20 different equations of, of this form. And that's how we calculate phase diagrams. If we simply find the compositions of the phases which satisfies a set of equations. Okay, see you in the next lecture.